clear cut. Can you set the scene? You're a historian of the Great Depression. How long was the great hangover after that event? Um, well, altogether, probably 12 or 13 years. So uh, the Great Depression started in 29. Um, and throughout the 30s, one, uh, we got a series of regulatory measures starting uh, with 33, um, the Glass-Steagall in 33, another Glass-Steagall in 35, uh, the Securities Act, uh, 34, I don't know, and the Investment Act of 1940. Uh, 1940. So it, it took quite a while. Um, and the 30s was not a good time for banks, um, and for a variety of reasons. One, uh, in a financial crisis comes at the end of a boom, so typically the sort of excess capacity in finance built up during the boom, and that takes a few years to work, work out. Um, and secondly, a whole series of regulations, uh, regulatory moves both to make the system safer and to deal with the conflicts of interest that typically emerge in a financial crisis. So Glass-Steagall separating investment banking from commercial banking actually had less to do with making the system safer. The very few big banks went under because they were uh, involved in both activities, but uh, in fact, none. Uh, but it was because it was perceived to be a massive conflict of interest. Citibank had been putting all its depositors into foreign bonds that it was underwriting. Um, uh, and then the third thing is banks naturally, after the good times, turn risk averse. So throughout the 1930s, banks, uh, even though deposits increased considerably, loans did not, and banks essentially put that money uh, into government bonds and decided to play, play it safe. And is it fair to say that long lag, or, or over a decade of uh, re-regulation, was it a technocratic process, or was it reflective of popular opinion and, and politicians' um, uh, desire to, to win votes? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I, uh, why did it take so long? Uh, one was that it, there was, you know, the New Deal was a lot more than just dealing with finance. There was, uh, so there was, uh, there was all sorts of legislative activity throughout the 1930s. So I'm not sure why it took till 1940, for example, uh, for the Investment Act. I don't, I don't really know the answer. And there was no equivalent of Frank Dodds where you have a quite rapid and massive... Well, there, there, was, the, there was the 33 uh, Glass-Steagall, and there was massive changes in the way the Fed operated, which was done in 35. So if you like, 33 and 35 essentially encompass the, um, uh, the, uh, what was done at Dodd-Frank. So by that measure, we're, we're about halfway through. Um, <laughs> I'm not uh, going to use the, the past to the predict the future. But it, <laughs> it's the best um, yardstick we have. And Annette, bearing in mind that, that um, how settled do you think the regulatory situation now is in the US? I mean, only in the last week we had signs of what appeared to be a turf war between the Fed and the SEC over who regulates markets. Um, are, is it still a moving feast, or are, can we begin to sort of define, define the new system reasonably clearly? Well, I think, although a lot has been accomplished, uh, the, the mandates under Dodd-Frank were enormous, and there's still a lot left to be done. And uh, even in those areas where progress has been made, some of the key features of those um, you know, uh, pieces of legislation are still not complete. So for example, when we look at all of the progress that's been made in the swaps area, you know, the, the amount of implementation uh, that's been done, particularly on the CFTC side, is really quite significant. But when you stop and say, well, you know, what is the impact going to really be um, on the markets, which I think is a sort of key question, uh, there are some really important features of it that still have yet to be completed, such as the capital rules and the margin rules. So we don't know what the impact is going to be until we see those uh, rules do, put do, in place. Do we know who's actually in charge yet? With that, we know. I think we know who's in charge. Um, 
but uh, in some other areas, as you suggest, um, I mean, not only do we have a lot of regulation that's being implemented, like the Volcker rule, where there is some, uh, I wouldn't say we don't know who's in charge. The problem is everybody's in charge, uh, which has made it very difficult from an implementation standpoint. There were some areas in Dodd-Frank where um, I guess Congress wasn't willing to make some difficult decisions. I mean, one, as you know, is that um, if ever there was an opportunity to consolidate the regulation and bring it all under a single umbrella and rationalize the process, this was the time. Uh, there was not an appetite to do that. And so we um, arguably ended up with, uh, I wouldn't say more regulators because we got rid of the OTS, but we added the Consumer Bureau. Uh, but what we ended up with was, you know, the FSOC, which is supposed to, you know, bring all the regulators together. And, and what we're seeing now is through that process, and you referenced it in your question, you know, the tension now uh, among the regulators, now that we're looking at systemic risk um, uh, writ large, uh, the question is, you know, when you define something as broad as systemic risk and you say, well, who should be looking at it? You know, we've had a traditional market regulator, uh, which was the SEC, and yet, um, you know, we're now seeing through speeches that, that uh, Fed governors are giving that there's talk about prudential market regulation and bringing a lot of um, market regulation that could, you know, have systemic implications under the FSOC umbrella. Well, obviously, if you do that and you define the activities as systemically important, then the Fed becomes the regulator. So th this is very much... Um, a moving target in terms of where all of this comes out. Uh, just briefly, the, the the Fed is is sort of king of king of this new system, um, even though it's it's still undefined. What's your sense of the Fed's capacity to do this? A complaint we quite often hear is uh, they don't have the right people. They don't have people who understand real world finance. They have a lot of academic. Um, uh, people, but not, not sort of real world pa practitioners. Well, I don't know if that's still the case. I mean, I think, you know, certainly the Fed, the Fed has, you know, more academics and more economists than any of the other uh, agencies. Um, I don't doubt their ability to attract good people just as, you know, the is, SEC. Is that a work in progress, have. do you think? I think it's a work in progress. I mean, I think a, a lot of the complaints. Um, you hear relate to the fact that now that the mandate is so broad, and for instance, if you start uh, designating insurance companies, let's say, as we have, as systemically important, they certainly don't have an expertise in the insurance area. And the fact that they're now going to be imposing, for instance, capital requirements on systemically important insurance companies is a little daunting. So, the, you know, I think the mandate has sort of gotten ahead of the ability, but I wouldn't... Um, doubt their ability to eventually get up to speed. Um, I'm going to quickly ask uh, our panel each to answer a very um, difficult question on the spot. Um, Frank Dodds looms large as uh, a, a sort of very imperfect piece of legislation. Um, and I wondered if, <coughs> if 10, was, 10 was perfect and zero was dreadful, where, where would you rate Frank Dodds? Um, how, how bad is the monster? Annette, perhaps you, you could give your guess first. Um, look, I think a lot of it makes sense. I think what happens is it doesn't take too much in a massive piece of legislation like that for um, the balance to be sort of off. Where, where so I would give it maybe is? an eight. But the two, but the, the other two are maddening things. <laughs> I think everybody has their own views of what those two that additional 20% is, but um, I, think, I think much of it works. I think there's just, there are some real problems with the things that don't work or that, that weren't well advised or so that are duplicative. More, more good than bad, though, you would say? I, I think more good than bad. Fair cup, do you have a? Five. Really? <laughs> Brad? Five sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say 10. No, I'd, I'd, say, I'd, say, I'd, say, more, I'd say more good than bad. Right. Um, yeah. Look, there's been, there's been a lot that's been accomplished with all this regulation that's had a real impact on the system. And you know whether over time people decide that all of that regulation makes the system better, actually allows people that interact in the system to get benefits from it, that'll, that'll be debated over time. And 
that legislation will be adjusted accordingly as people have more experience in really understanding what the implications are, but more good than bad. Uh, just lastly, on, on the sort of issue of, of the, the regulatory inheritance we now have, how much worse do you think the position is in the US in terms of regulatory complexity, simply because the process involves many more agencies and uh, to some degree politicians, um, uh, you know, compared to a really quite technocratic process, certainly in Europe, for example. Does anyone have a view on that? Is this a particular disadvantage America has? Well, you know, I think it's always been a problem. I think it's exacerbated now. Um, I think it's worse than it was, because even though we supposedly, again, have this overlay of the, um, the FSOC, I think the fact of the matter is when you have major portions of Dodd-Frank, such as the Volcker Rule, and it's really being implemented and overseen by five agencies, and they really don't agree on a lot of what's going on. I mean, it, it really is quite daunting that you have um, regulated entities that are asking for um, advice on what the interpretations are, and the agencies can't agree, and they therefore cannot even put out FAQs, frequently asked questions to answer uh, basic issues. I mean, the, the most um, uh, stark example of that was that one of the first questions that was asked, there was a ambiguity in the language on when some of the metrics reporting uh, was to begin. Uh, and you could read it a number of ways because of the way it was drafted in different sections of, uh, of the uh, regulations. And because of a disagreement, you couldn't get the regulators to tell you for months when the start date was. So I mean, if you, if you have that kind of dysfunction, that doesn't, um, that doesn't bode well. So I, I think it's, in that sense, it's gotten worse. It's very difficult for regulatory agencies to uh, coordinate and they're required to coordinate more in Dodd-Frank than they ever have before. We're gonna to turn to what it's like to be on the receiving end of um, this revolution. And, and David, I wondered if you could talk a bit about cultural change in particular um, at banks. Um, obviously the perception uh, widely held as something went wrong almost in the DNA of many many banks. It was more than simply about rules. There wasn't a, a clear sense of right and wrong and so on. What, what's happened at Goldman and how has your culture adapted and changed to this new world? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, very, it's very hard for me to comment broadly about other institutions. But look, I, I'd, I'd say just as a starting point, culture matters an enormous amount in any organization, especially in big complex organizations. And our business is one that's a complex business. It's a human capital business. Uh, the people that work in our business are intensely competitive. It is an intensely competitive business. And if you don't have a culture that really supports over a long period of time the things that really matter in the context of what you stand for, the way you serve your clients, the way you operate, what your, how your people are supposed to behave both in the business mm. and also out of the business and as they progress out of the business, um, you, you over the long run won't have, a, won't have a good business, won't have a good business that productively contributes to, um, to the community, to society. And so we've always felt very strongly that the culture of the firm has mattered a lot. Now in the context of that coming out of the financial crisis, you know, we really took a hard, you know, we went back and took a hard look as we do, you know, oftentimes and say, okay, you know, where, you know, where are there things that we need to look at differently? Where are things that we need to examine? We put together a committee called the Client Business Standards Committee. We went out, we polled our clients because sometimes clients' perception is more important than your own perception to try to understand, look, see about things that we can involve. We put out uh, a large list, um, nearly 40 different steps that we were gonna take to make sure that the cultural foundations that have carried the firm for 145 years were in place and that they would continue, and that a lot of the leadership that some of the great leaders of the firm, like a John Whitehead, you know, very timely you know, today, had provided, both while they were at the firm and in some of the things they stood for you know, as they left the firm, would continue to be a very important part of the kind of people we have in the organization. And hopefully, they'd make the right decisions to do the right thing. Now, we run a big organization with a lot of people. And at times, there are people that don't do the right things. But it's the responsibility of leadership to constantly be working to make sure that you're getting that right. 
So what, and what's we a, stay very focused on it. What's a practical example? I mean, say, for, for argument's sake, I'm a trader of credit default swaps at Goldman Sachs. How has my life changed? You know, I, I'm not gonna. I, I'm not gonna go take a particular <laughs> trader in a particular product. But look, our because job. You're, you're our referring job, to this in an incredibly abstract way. Where well, but our our job is our our job is to do the right thing for our clients and our stakeholders over a long period of time. We're very very focused on that, and I think that any organization that isn't focused on that over some period of time is not going to be a successful organization. And so. You know, that's, that is core to any, any good business. Have you embedded a sense of ethics into how people are paid? Is it possible to do that? Have we embedded a sense of, look, I think all incentive systems have to be aligned to get the right results, and it goes back to your culture. You're trying to serve your clients, you're trying to serve your stakeholders, you're trying to do the right thing. We've always tried to have incentives that are modeled in that sense, and, um, and we continue to try to do that. And on regulation, do, can you give us a sense of how much time senior management now has to spend thinking about regulation um, as a result of, of the, the, the sort of post-crisis? Look, there's, been, there's been an enormous amount of regulation, and so there's no question that not just senior management, but an organization like ours has been forced to add to the organization, hire lots of people that have been forced to spend time understanding the regulation, integrating the the, the regulation into our business and adapting our business to deal with the new regulatory, uh, the new regulatory requirements. Um, I think that our senior leadership is mostly focused on our clients and our business, but there's no question we've had to add to the organization in order to adapt. We've made some decisions. We've gotten out of some businesses um, because the regulatory environment has changed and there are now certain businesses that either we can't be in or certain businesses that under the new regulatory rules don't produce adequate returns for our stakeholders and therefore it doesn't make sense for us to continue in them. But generally speaking, the leadership of the firm is focused on our clients and our business and making sure we're doing the right thing. Brad, um, we're gonna talk in a moment about your business specifically, but before we do that, um, what is your sense of, of the public's view of finance and the degree of trust, both the, you know, the guy on Main Street, but also a financial market practitioner, fund and investor, uh, you know, how do they feel? Do they think things have improved a lot or do they remain quite cynical? I, th I mean, you know, I did, I grew up in the industry. Um, so I haven't worked in any other industry. So I found, I spent a lot of time, uh, I spent a lot of time defending the industry that seems to be defined by by the worst actors, and I think, uh, like any industry, you have, um, you know, you have people that are doing this for the right reasons, and you have some people that come here for for the wrong reasons. And I think um, the, the unfortunate part is kind of the, the series of, of issues that have that have happened. Um, people tend to focus on on the actions of the bad actors and try to paint very broad brushes. You know, I, was, I remember. Uh, there was a time when we just started IEX. We had no money. We were in this tiny room, and I'm walking to a, to try to raise money with a suit on. I walk by Occupy Wall Street, and they're throwing stuff at me. I'm like, oh, my. you know, like it's a, it, it's um, I think trying to trying to trying to get people to understand that the the, this, the, the role Wall Street plays is critical. Um, helping businesses raise capital, um, you know, helping investors allocate that capital. I think that function will will always exist, and it's largely a service business. And, and um, at the same time, you know, you have a transactional business uh, on, in trading, and that, that's kind of what I grew up in. I was a trader myself, and um, what you find is that the service business tends to have a very long-term view. If you're an investment bank, you meet companies and you help them grow, and you're with them through, you know, various stages of their growth. Trading is very different, where it's very transaction-oriented. It's very short-term. It's very about the trade, and I think what, what, what you tend to have is, is a blend of the service aspect and long-term thinking, and in the transactional aspect. And, and Wall Street, in many ways, I think, if you look at some of the issues that have come out, largely is revolves around the transaction-natured businesses. It's about short-term thinking. It's about, um, and, 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 it, and it's hard, because it's, it's part of that business. I think that kind of when we look at how to restore trust, it is you know, exactly what David said. It's fo focusing long-term, focusing on the clients. And um, you know, unfortunately, I think that people have at times, made poor choices focused, you know, on short-term incentives, um, and whether it's creating a complicated, you know, when you think about transactions, 
the advantage comes from information asymmetry. Yep. So, so you're motivated to um, hoard information, to possibly misinform. Like in that type of nature, where it's a it's a it's a it's a transaction, and information is so important, um, it does at times motivate people to do to do the wrong thing. And I think that um, what you need is you need more long-term thinkers. You need people focused more on um, the service aspect of the business. And, and it's unfortunate that it's being defined by, by the worst actors. Um, but I think, again, the, the things that have happened are making Wall Street a better place to work. Uh, only because the, the, the function is critical. The players, at times, are being held accountable. Um, maybe, at times, they're not being held as accountable as they could be. Uh, but ultimately, you know, 20 years from now, I think Wall Street is probably a better place to work than it is now, and now is probably a better place than it was 20 years ago. If you're, if you're running one of these businesses, if your clients don't trust you, if your clients don't want to work with you, if your clients don't want to transact with you, you won't have a business for very long. So, you know, there's no question that when you think about your business, you have to take a perspective on that. Now, given what's happened in the financial crisis, you know, the broad public definitely has a lack of distrust, and you can lose, you, you does not trust, and you can lose that trust very quickly. It takes a long time to gain it back. I think one of the things that we feel very good about is our clients have stuck with us, and they've stuck with us because I think they think we do a good job for them, and I think they think that we do things in a way that serves their interests and their needs. Over time, it's our job to earn the trust of the public back over a period of time. But the public, on a day-to-day -day basis, is not dealing with us, transacting with us. You're less exposed. Leah, how, how long does it take? Again, uh, what's the historical? <laughs> well, I, I'd like to go back to what you've just been talking about, yep. because um, I think it goes beyond just the financial crisis. I mean, if you pick up the paper, over the last three years, you've read about uh, LIBOR, uh, the LIBOR scandal, the FX scandal, money laundering. Today, we've seen stuff on HSBC. So the public is hit by a barrage of, um, of stories about banks and bankers misbehaving. And so when, some, when a guy like Bill Dudley says, it's not simply a matter of a few bad apples, you've got to actually worry about the barrel. Um, is, you know, that speaks to me. So, uh, but, you, but you were saying earlier that, you know, if you, again, if you look at Wall Street historically, by, it, by the 1950s, it had become viewed again as a sort of staid, boring place. Sure. I mean, place, but it a, seemed, seemed a period very slow of moving. low profitability actually brings a bit of sense. <laughs> uh, so during the 20s, uh, the senior management of Citibank used to take 20% of the profits as their bonus pool. And we got all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of things being done that were sort of apparent, you know, uh, which came to light in the PCORA Commission, which, which, uh, in which Wall Street came up looking very bad. Um, uh, most famous story is uh, in 29, during the Great Crash, Albert Wiggins, the CEO of Chase, uh, made $4 million that year by shorting the stock of his own bank. Uh, so, you know, talk about conflict of interest. Um, all of that, what, Albert Wiggins was replaced by uh, uh, Winthrop Aldrich, who was uh, a part of the Rockefeller family, and Chase transformed itself as an institution into a very staid sort of place. Uh, and those things, as Brad said, take a while. So that Wall Street will be, you know, will eventually, a period of low profitability and uh, sort of this, the, the, sh the light of bad publicity, I think will change things, but it takes a while. I want to turn to, to some of the sort of implications of, of uh, the regulatory um, settlement and, and public opinion. Um, and, uh, two, two or three possibilities. I'd like to start with one, which is, is the viability of some banks now under serious question? Um, if you look at the world's top 20 banks on our, well, not on our numbers, on Bloomberg's numbers, um, three quarters of them fail to make a return on equity of 10% or more last year and are forecast to be similarly poor this year. 
And there's a bit of market chatter about, you know, Citigroup being broken up, Deutsche Bank is having a strategic review. Have we created a situation where some of the big banks may be broken up by their shareholders, not by regulators? No. How can we create that situation? It, are we now in the situation where the biggest threat to big banks is not actually regulators, but their owners going, you guys don't make enough money? Well, that, that ultimately may be an issue, although I don't think that um, we've seen this play out long enough to, uh, to necessarily have that be a concern. I mean, look, the, the costs of implementation of all this regulation are very high, and those costs are borne across the industry. Much of the regulation that um, was implemented was not done according to size. So the small banks are subject to the same regulatory challenges as the large banks. Uh, there's some pushback on that now, and I think we'll see some pushback on that politically. But if you think about it, something like the Volcker Rule does not distinguish between large and small, and yet the implementation costs are very significant. So I think you're seeing the results of um, those regulatory costs in the returns of the banks. Uh, perhaps when that first you know, um, push to implement is, is done, things will settle out a bit. I don't think we know that yet. Um, but certainly that's... Do we care? Um, I think we care to the extent that, uh, you know, I don't think it's like too big, too small, you know, too hot, too cold. I think we, we care about having the most efficient uh, regulatory system that we can, uh, both uh, because it's good for the economy and it's good for the capital markets, but also because it's good um, from a competitive standpoint vis-a-vis -vis our you know, competitive uh, uh, position worldwide. And so I, I think we want to we get it right. Well, we care because the costs aren't just borne by the financial institutions, they're borne by everybody right. that participates in the market and the economy and getting that balance right over time is important for economic growth. But what, what, I mean, at Goldman, what's your operating assumption, right? You're one of the banks that is making a, a respectable return along, there's a few of you, but do, do you assume the rest of the peer group just carries on in a sort of zombie fashion forever, or do some of these folks No, <laughs> we, do not, we, do not, uh, we do not assume that, and we also use the word viability. <laughs> you know, organizations, have to, over a period of time, earn an adequate return on their capital, or there are a whole variety of pressures that will change that. That period of time is not you know, one year, 10 minutes, they're all different exogenous factors that affect how that will play out, but there's no question that there are a variety of institutions that are not earning an adequate return on their capital, and over time, they will be forced to adjust their business models. They'll be forced to either get out of certain businesses, or change their cost structures, or I uh, do their businesses in different ways to find a way to get to a place that is a steward of capital, their shareholders' capital, the capital that basically is owned by all the people in the Main Street economy, uh, that that capital is shepherded in a way where they get adequate returns. But it's not, it's not a binary thing, and I think to Annette's point, it's too early to know, you know which ones will survive as they are, which ones will change, and how that will play out over time. But it will take time, and there's no question there's always pressure in business to perform on a relative basis, you know, better than, uh, than, than the average and certainly to provide reasonable returns. Um, I mean, my perspective is during a boom, and we had a probably, what, a 20-year boom, uh, many in an industry like finance during a financial boom overexpands. And so when the bad times come, not surprisingly, this, the industry is too large and needs to contract in some way. And so we will get some sort of consolidation. I think one of the challenges is the consolidation typically leads to more concentration, which then exacerbates the problem of too big to fail. And so I don't think we've quite figured out you know, the trade-offs involved, but it's quite clear to me, and I think we've seen this in the past, that we've tended to get consolidation coming after financial crises. Japan was the classic example. Um, we had a financial crisis. We got the bank crisis in 97. And since then, we've had the number of banks in Japan shrink. We've had mergers. Um, and we've had this whole financial system become smaller. 
Um, a second implication of, of all of this is opportunity, not just, just pain. Um, Brad, you've, you've built a business um, uh, and are growing that business partly because of, of a change in attitudes towards equity trading. Can you tell us a bit about that and, and the, the speed at which you can, you can grow and take market share? Sure. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, we've seen, we've, we've seen, a, you know, based on regulation, we've seen a cycle. No, you know, I think we, uh, there's probably a good consensus view. No rule is perfect. Um, so what happens with, when you have regulation is it creates a cycle where rules will create certain inefficiencies in the markets, at least the, in equity markets is what we've seen. Um, those inefficiencies are then exploited. Um, the exploitation pushes it to the brink of scandal, and that scandal creates a new set of regulation. Regulation, inefficiency, inefficiency gets exploited. Exploit, you, know, you exploit it to the nth degree. And, and for us, we kind of came in and saw that, you know, and, and the, the rule changes that came into the equity markets were very sensible. You had, you had multiple markets. You needed to link the market together. I think that um, what happened is it, it, it ended up creating a, a bit of a, of a technology arms race. It created um, this notion that, um, you know, forcing people to behave in a certain way within the, the scope of the regulation um, could lead to very predictable behavior. And, and I think um, what happened is instead of uh, the market, in a way, saying this regulation has created, there are benefits, but it's created some inefficiencies, instead of looking to solve for those inefficiencies, um, the markets itself, and this goes right down to the, the exchanges, uh, look to exploit those inefficiencies by selling data, by selling you know, technology, et cetera. And I think from our standpoint, we, we view IEX as a market-based solution to some inefficiencies that exist in the market. Uh, we're looking to do things in, 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 a, in a different kind of way. Um, and part of that was an understanding of what current regulation exists. You know, the fact that IEX exists um, within a highly regulated market, uh, we haven't asked for anything, it's just we've created a different kind of solution, I think number one, it says a lot about the regulation. It does allow for innovation within that. Uh, but number two, it, it, we've created such huge controversy because for some reason, the, the, all the players in the game were incentivized to, to, to build one type of market, um, uh, largely designed around exploiting the inefficiencies that, that currently exist. So I feel like, you know, in a way, uh, as, as society is pushing Wall Street in a way to be more transparent, holding it accountable in certain areas, um, you know, the way that Wall Street evolves is going to also be from within. Um, so, you know, hopefully they're there. And we, we've seen a, a string of them. A lot of them have come into our office. We see a series, you know, this kind of long series of, of entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs within our industry looking to do things differently. And, you know, we've developed great relationships inside the industry. You know, it's, it, it's a coincidence, I guess, that we're next to David. Goldman's one of our best clients. They were our top trading client in, in 2014. So, We've found a way to, to build a business within the regulatory structure, uh, build relationships with financial firms, and give them an option to, to, to conduct business in a way that benefits their clients. We're owned by you know, large mutual funds and, and, and but, hedge but, funds. But, but in your case, the most interesting question from, from a sort of big picture point of view is you're essentially operating a business that, in, as you argue, it behaves in a better way than the competition. Yes. And the question is, what is the opportunity set for behaving like that? Is it a minority sport where you get some business on Wall Street, but the bulk of activity occurs to the old bad rules? Or? Right, well, it's, it's a great question. I think that if, you know, you, you're trying to create a- Are you, are you, because I suppose the risk is you're a sort of fig leaf that yeah. <laughs> the, um, the, covers uh, others. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the truth is, is that it's a, uh, given the people at IEX, we have experience in exchanges, high frequency trading, like very in-depth market knowledge. Is this the best short-term way to monetize our, in, our market in knowledge? No, it's to actually exploit the problem. We know what the problems are. Solving it is actually, solving it and explaining it is much harder than just going in and doing it. Um, the long-term view is that we actually can benefit and cre can create a sustainable business based on educating, engaging the general public, engaging the, the street, and creating a long-term scalable solution. So we're long-term greedy in a way. Uh, rather than saying short term, how do we make the most possible money right now? Um, the real choice comes in, in the, you know, the end users of the market. 
the clients of the market? Are they going to make choices that reward people for making choices in their best interest? Because if, if the penalty for behaving badly is very tiny relative to the reward, what do rational people do in that, in that circumstance? I think if the penalty to behaving badly is high relative to the reward, I think you start to change behavior. So I think part of this is about the industry, part of it's about the clients, part of it's about, you know, there, there's a lot of responsibility going up the chain. So I think for us, our success is largely based on, number one, the industry kind of rallying around a solution that's market-based, that, that isn't, you know, looking to the regulators to solve this issue. But number two, it's, it's the clients. Um, do the client, are the clients going to get behind people that are looking to represent their best interests? You, you have a 1% market share now. What, where might that go in the long run? <laughs> I, I hope much higher than that, right? It, it's, uh, you know, we started, when we started IEX, not a lot of people thought we could do it. It was, it was very hard to raise money. Um, so we, we raised enough money just to be a dark pool. Um, we started off the 45th ranked dark pool, and, and based on FINRA reporting, we're now the fourth largest. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's been a pretty fast rise in a year. We filed to become an exchange. Uh, hopefully, that happens later this year. So, putting the building blocks in place um, to build a you know a, a, a market-based uh, alternative to the current system, I think it, it was very important. And and you know finding a way to do that within regulation. Regulation does create high barriers to entry for for innovation. Um, but understanding the regulatory structure and trying to innovate within that, I also think is is extremely important. That's something that we're we're really focused on. Okay, we're going to um, turn to, to you, the audience, and ask for some questions. I think there are some mics uh, circulating around. Perhaps if we could start with the gentleman here. Thank you. Yes, I have a question for Mr. Solomon. Um, the, uh, the history, I believe, of Goldman Sachs was that it was a pure investment bank. And uh, with the abolition of Glass-Steagall, and after the financial crisis, you and Morgan Stanley, I believe, also started issuing CDs, the Certificates of Deposit, which are insured by the FDIC. What was the motivation for that? Was that uh, to assist you in the case of another financial meltdown somewhere in the future, uh, like, the, like we saw with Lehman Brothers, that uh, you would expect the government to come in, to perhaps come in and help bail you out? So why become a bank? Well, we, we became a bank because in the context of the crisis, the, uh, the regulatory system forced the remaining investment banks to become regulated under the Fed umbrella. And as a result, we became a bank holding company. Um, so in the context of now that we're a bank holding company, we have a bank, we have to have a bank, we do take deposits. But compared to the big money center banks that we would talk about, our deposit base is very, very small. Uh, and it's a small, growing business for us. We provide, we take deposits from our clients in our high wealth system. Um, we make loans to clients in our high wealth system. Uh, we make loans to, you know, to other clients. But in the context of what you'd think about as a traditional money center deposit taking lending bank that makes lots of mortgages and lots of personal loans on a retail basis, that's not a business that we're in in any significance. From a regulatory structure perspective, we're now a regulated bank institution, um, and we're regulated in that context. And was that your choice, or did the Fed make you an offer you couldn't refuse? Uh, if, if, if the, at the time of the crisis, uh, that was a decision that we participated in with the regulators as the right thing for the system broadly. Uh, do we have another question? I think there's a lady there in the middle. Um. In 20 years, do you think that the regulatory structure is going to be more at the national or international level? What's it going to look like in 20 years? Uh, I think it will still be national. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, I, we certainly see that now, right? There, I think there'll be more cooperation internationally on regulation. I think we're seeing that now with the Financial Stability Board and the G20 commitments. I mean, there's a lot more of a commitment to um, sort of have greater sort of conversion of you know standards, uh, more consistency of international st of uh, national standards. But the fact of the matter is, we are at base, you know, uh, different uh, countries, and I think we will continue to have. I, I don't see in 20 years uh, that we would have too much of a change in that regard. Um, Mervyn King, the, the, um, the former governor of the Bank of England, 
uh, coined this phrase. He said, banks are uh, global in life, but national in death. Right. And, and okay. essentially, when banks get into trouble, it's their governments that bail them out. And as a consequence, and since regulation is so intimately associated with sort of the, who's the lender of last resort and who steps in when there's a problem, I, I think uh, national regulations will, will override any international. I guess the Eurozone now isn't an experiment in transnational <laughs> bank regulation, but probably not a very successful one. Um, do, do we have another question? Um, the gentleman on the side there. Thank you. The, is there a, do the panelists think that there's been a perverse incentive or there exists a perverse incentive under Dodd-Frank or other reforms for uh, subsectors such as asset managers or clearing uh, houses to not be open about systemic risks uh, or prospective uh, systemic risks so that they, lest they be designated as SIFIs or come under a more extreme uh, regulatory burden. I mean, because it seems sometimes that the risks in the system have been pushed from the banking sector's balance sheet to asset managers and clearing and uh, settlement institutions. I mean, is there a perverse incentive to not look at the next risk rather than so try we, to fight the last war? Have we created just a new kind of monster hidden somewhere else? Does anyone want to? Well, I don't think the clearing houses have been able to hide. Um, you know, they're. They basically are treated as systemically important. Uh, are they uh, capitalized enough, though? Well, I think we'll continue to study that, but they are, they're certainly under intense scrutiny. Right? They're, they're considered systemically important financial market utilities, so they're in a different category from the banks, but they're sort of equally uh, important, and certainly you see in some of the recent Fed statements, they're sort of front and center in terms of um, attention, regulatory attention. Um, Look, with the asset managers, I think that's a you know that's an area of debate. Um, uh, I I think there's a you know you know that there's uh, uh, questions out now by the um, FSOC on on trying to analyze whether um, asset managers are systemically important, which I think they're really not. They're conduits, or are you know is the activity something that needs to be regulated as systemically important? And that's uh, you know, people differ on that, and I think there's going to be a lot of analysis. And as I said, there's a, um, you know, the regulators are out there, you know, asking those questions and trying to get, um, you know, some feedback on that. I think there's clearly a difference of opinion. I think the interesting uh, response I thought was what um, uh, Chair White at the SEC came up with to say, look, if there's, if these are activities that are important, let's talk about what it is about those activities that need to be regulated, and we'll do that. We don't need to necessarily regulate that activity in some way that's different. I mean, what is it? Are we worried about concentration? We'll have concentration limits. We think the leverage is too high, we'll have leverage limits. But let's look at specifically what it is about that activity. Because I think now, you know, everybody sort of waves their hands and says everything is systemically important. I think we need a little more discipline around it. So I think once, once they get the data, I think the SEC can propose uh, rules. She also floated the idea of stress testing and potentially having living wills uh, of a sort for for the large, um, you know, the largest institutions. Those are ideas that I suppose are worthy of consideration. The, could we do the lady in the front row first, please? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, I want to pick up on your question on sort of the lackluster returns of banks and just speak broadly um, about growth. So Peter Thiel, who is coming on stage later, he's very critical of the banking sector and says that, you know, if you look at all the growth and innovation that we've seen in the economy, IPOs and such, um, it's all from, from Silicon Valley. Where are the growth markets? Where are the growth opportunities that will make banks continue to be relevant in this economy? You know, the comment, that there, there are, there's obviously a lot of visibility when companies go public and capital forms around a bunch of these young businesses in Silicon Valley. There's always a lot of visibility around that. Um, the reality of it is, is that there are lots of companies going public in all different sectors and lots of capital forming across all different businesses. And there's lots of innovation in the economy and financial institutions and the investors that participate with them play a meaningful role in providing that capital. Uh, there's growth in lots of different places in the world. 
and there's innovation in lots of different places in the world. I thought one of the most interesting things that was said on the panel was when we were talking about the financial industry and Brad talked about the fact that, that regulation actually stifles innovation. So one of the industries that's getting less disrupted in certain ways by technology and other, uh, other practices is the financial services industry. But there's lots of growth in the economy, software, data, very, very powerful, disrupting lots of businesses. There's lots of capital forming around different ways to think about how software and technology affect businesses. You know, at a high level, when you have technology that allows cars to be safer because you have software and cars that signals when you cross a lane, that signals when you're close to somebody, and it brings accident rates down. How does that affect property and casualty insurers, and how is their business disrupted if accident rates go down? So there's, there's massive disruption going on in businesses everywhere from technology. That's a big theme, and that's creating lots of opportunity for financial institutions to come in, provide capital, and try to support and help these businesses grow, and that's, at the end of the day, you know, hopefully all positive for, uh, you know, for all of us and economic growth more broadly. Thank you. One, one last question. The lady we missed last time. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I heard Brad say that you were on your way to be registered as an exchange. You were seeking to do so. So could you just comment a bit uh, and others on uh, is that the way forward for dark pools and what are the what kind of confidence should we have as a result of such registration that we don't have now? Sure. So I think a lot of the initiatives that we have seen uh, have been around transparency. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening in these markets that, that are not documented, um, whether it be rules, pricing, um, order types, or, or other. And I think that, again, the, the, the regulatory scrutiny that you see around dark pools, I think, will ultimately make those venues uh, probably safer to trade. And uh, you can probably have greater trust that they are operating in a way with which you would want them to, as opposed to uh, years ago, um, you know, there's a thing called Reg, Reg SCI that's raising the, the technological standards to operating uh, in a, a market, whether it be an exchange or a large uh, ATS, which is also an alternative trading system, which is a dark pool. So I think the standards for operating these markets is going up. Uh, and as a result, I, I just don't think it's, it's possible to have as many markets as we have now. There are over 50 places where you can trade. Um, in U.S. equities, and that, that number will go down as the, as the bar to operate these venues goes up. So I think over time you'll see, you'll see that. And the ones that remain, you know, probably uh, I would say you, you'll have a uh, remain for more legitimate reasons than they might have otherwise existed right now. So I think that it, it, it's going to make things better. I'm afraid, um, I'm sorry, we're out of time. I'm, I, I'm going to finish with asking everyone uh, 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 for the, a very quick response to a question. Um, are America's capital markets and financial system a competitive advantage for the country, as has been the case for a long period of time, or are they now a liability? Very quickly, Annette. Um, I think we continue to have the uh, capital markets that are the envy of the world, and um, uh, I think we're still you know, implementing all of our... Um, Financial reforms, but uh, likewise, financial reforms are being implemented in other other financial centers, and so uh, I'm not willing to concede that we're not still number one. Yeah. Oh, very much so. Can you imagine if all of this was done by banks? <laughs> <laughs> Brad? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a pretty dramatic there's there's a huge room for improvement. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have quit our jobs to to start IEX if we didn't think that there was a huge opportunity, uh, but I do think it, um, you know, for the improvements, a lot of the improvements we've seen have been a result of technology, not, not necessarily because the players are using technology to the, to the max benefit of the end user. And I think it's about trying to take advancements you see in broader technology and applying that more directly uh, to benefit the end users of this system, the issuers and, and the investors. So a big, lot of, lot of room for improvement. David? Um, Definitely a good system, but one that there's a lot of room for improvement. And what I'd just say is that this position that we've had where we've had the best capital markets, the deepest capital markets, the most interesting capital markets, and have therefore provided 
terrific services in that context has been a competitive advantage. I don't think we should take it for granted. The world is much more competitive. And if we're not very thoughtful as we go forward about protecting that position, that position is not something that we can just count on. Um, a lot of people see this as a real opportunity for growth in their economy, and I think we need to be really thoughtful as we go forward to make sure we get the balance right. Well, on the basis of Leah Cutts' um, book, um, we have another uh, four or five years before <laughs> regulation uh, is over, um, so we may well just run the same panel uh, every year at this conference for another half decade. Um, uh, but I'm very grateful indeed for all of the panelists, and thank you also to the audience. Thanks. Thank you.